Trinity, how are you this morning? All right. That's pretty good participation there with that one. I, uh, it, Pastor, I'm going to let you off the hook. I picked my nose too, just being honest with you. Sometimes you just got to go up to the second knuckle and just get after it. I mean, and, and you know what I'm talking about because you can't be trying to get you a good breath in, especially in these days. We talk about breathing, you know, with all the sickness going around, but you can't have it with a flapper going in and out, all right? So you got to, sometimes you just got to go in there and get it. And if you can't admit that, then you need to, you're lying to yourself today. And uh, I mean, my favorite time to pick my nose when I'm driving. Might as well get it. Go on up to outer space and get it. I'm glad to be here today. Please don't get up and walk out. My wife's not traveling with me today. See, I'm picking my nose right now. I feel it right now. <laughs> the Lord has a sense of humor, don't he? <clears throat> my wife's not traveling with me today, and she's probably thankful that she's not because she would tell me how embarrassed she, she was. But she's, uh, she's at home with our little one today, and, and uh, um, she got up. Had, this morning was getting up and getting ready and, and had a tension headache, and, and I told her, I said, just stay, just stay there. And uh, on top of that, we're trying to potty train our son, and we're getting somewhere in that, and it's good for him to maybe be home today and figure that out. <laughs> so how many of you glad you're potty trained? <laughs> so, uh, but my wife, she's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lady. I'm married way, way up. And uh, she's a speech therapist. She works at uh, uh, two middle schools. And uh, how many of you know it's important to, to help somebody be able to communicate? Opening up your mouth and, and being able to talk is, is a very, very important thing. I don't, I don't know if there's anything more important than that. And, uh, and she does that every day with, with middle schoolers. And, and our little boy, Griffin, he's, he's three and a half. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, he's, he's doing everything at his own pace. Uh, he's good at hitting other kids. We found that out. And uh, he goes to a parent's day out. And sometimes he has good days and sometimes he has bad days. But I'm going to tell you, every day is a good day with that little boy in this father's eyes. I love him more than anything. And I can't help but think what the, what the world's going to look like as he grows, what the, what the school systems are going to look like when he walks down the halls. And some of you may not know this, but I'm a U.S. missionary. I'm a U.S. missionary right here to the state of Tennessee, to our middle schools and our high schools. And you, and you say, why do we need that? Well, our middle schools and our high schools of the biggest mission field there is. That's a place where they've said that he doesn't belong. And I don't, I don't want to, listen, I'm going to say some things today that may challenge you, and I promise you I'm not, I'm not trying to get on you today. I'm, I'm trying to provoke you. So years ago the church sat back and they let the world do what they wanted to do, and they went and they stripped prayer out of our schools. Now, you can say whatever you want to, but the bottom line is, is the church didn't do what they needed to do. The world cared more about their opinion than the church did about theirs. And what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. I've heard our youth director, we got a great youth director in Pastor Jeremy Austell, and I've heard him say, don't knock the younger generation because you raised them. Don't you be throwing off on these young people. They're a product of their father and their mother. Whether their father and their mother was around, they're a product of their father and their mother. We're going to talk about that today, but they're a product of you. And if you, toler if you tolerate it today, they'll embrace it tomorrow. This group of young people that we have walking the halls of our middle schools and high schools. They're, they're the most intelligent generation that's ever walked planet earth. Everything in, in our culture, our music, our advertising, everything that you see on TV is based around them and their taste. They're the ones that's going to run your towns later on. They're the ones that's going to teach your great-great-grandkids. They're the ones that's going to run for office. They're the ones that's going to pick up your trash and deliver your mail. They're the ones that's going to be the nurse at the hospital when, when you have an emergency. They're going to be the hygienist that cleans your teeth. Don't be cursing the, the ones that's going to take care of you one day. 
Because I promise you that time will come. We have an opportunity every day. And I don't know if you guys have, you guys got a great youth pastor with Pastor Thomas and, and Lindsay. And they, listen, they're, they have just become rock stars. Yeah, they're rock stars in my eyes. I mean, this is, these guys right here, rock stars, go get her. I mean, seeing this speed of light stuff, I mean, this guy gets it. I love this man right here in a, in a bromo kind of way, you know what I mean? I love him. And, and he cares about this younger generation. I love your pastor. Good man. Pastor Chuck, good man. Love him. You want, you want to know what I love about him? I love, I love them because they love the Lord, they love their family, and they love their church. They're fathers. They're fathers. And we have an opportunity with our students. They're coming to our camps, they're coming to our conventions, and the Holy Spirit's moving in their life, and they're having real encounters with the one. And God is calling them to do something incredible with their life. But they've got to have a father and a mother to push them, to get them there, to give them the opportunities. I bought a bracelet this morning from a little girl in this church. I don't even know her name. I'm not going to wear it because it's not real manly, but she was selling that bracelet for speed to light. She was just going to give it to me today, and I gave her some money for it. And I thought, here's a young lady. who was doing a ministry right here at her church. All because somebody gave her the opportunity. See, that money's going to go overseas and somebody's going to be able to drink clean water because a little girl did all she knew to do to make this right here. And they're going to drink a clean water and they're going to find the living water. All because a dollar will go where my feet will never touch. So you don't understand the magnitude that you have in this house. You get to shape the church of today. And they're on your watch. I could talk all day about the programs that we do, we do school assemblies, we set up campus clubs. Literally, they meet in classrooms across the state, and they literally have church in their, right there in their school. They lead worship together. They, they fellowship together. They eat together some, you know. It may be a bag of chips and a candy bar, but they fellowship. And there's students that are literally pastoring a church inside of their school. Kids are coming to know Jesus before the bell rings. But somebody had to give them that opportunity. And so I, I just thank you for, for having me in today. And listen, if you're in, I'm not going to talk about money. You know, I'm a missionary. I raise money. But, you know, if you're interested in that, you can come see me afterwards. But we've got a, we've got a campus missions conference that's coming up on August 14th. And I just want to give you a glimpse of, of a little bit of the training that we'll do. Just a little bit. to look there this was from the year before last we, we, we weren't able to do it last year because of everything going on I think that was roughly around 220 campus missionaries coming together 220 kids saying I will go to my school and I will do everything I can to reach somebody for the one and you say wow yeah I can clap 220 220 you say well that's a good number of kids yeah when you spread it out that's over 20,000 students that will be touched in some kind of way from that 220. August 14th, we'll be having another one. I hope we have more. 
more and more and more, and so we're excited about that. And listen, you just keep your eyes and ears open. Revival is coming to our schools. I believe it with everything in me. Turn to Judges 13, 1 through 14 today. Judges 13, 1 through 14. We're going to read a little bit. We're going to continue. What I'm going to share today, I'm going to talk a lot about the father because I'm a guy, I'm a father, I'm a son. For you ladies in the room, just know we're talking about you too as a mother. And when I get onto these men this morning, just cheer on a little bit harder. <laughs> we're a product of our, of our father, aren't we? I'm a product of my father, I'm a product of a, of a good mother. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, that you don't eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead and deliver in Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again and teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. And God heard Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here. The man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? And the angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do everything I have told her. She must not eat anything unclean that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Two people in this story. Two people. Manoah and his wife. Manoah and the woman. They had an important role. Manoah was the father of Samson. And the woman was the mother. Samson, the greatest, strongest, strongest man to ever walk the planet. So you may not have heard the name Manoah very often, but Manoah had an important role, didn't he? He was the father of a fighter, of a warrior, a strong man. Samson was a product of his father and his mother. Before I say anything else, can we just bow our heads in this room? If you've got a prayer language, can you just let it out? Just do a work in us, God, for the next few minutes. Just saturate us, Lord. Down to our bones today, God. Open our minds to realize what it is that we're responsible for. Greatness. We're responsible for raising greatness. Knock some things out of our life, God, that, that are no good. So that we can do everything we need to. Move in our hearts today, God. 
Jesus' name. We've got to prepare ourselves to receive today. We talked about pouring into these kids. You know, the greatest thing you could ever do for these young people is not tell them how to live, but to show them how to live. So you can tell them to your bull in the face, but they'll do what they see. What you tolerate, they'll embrace. I'm a product of a good father and a good mother. I remember growing up, I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. Roll Tide. Don't walk out on me. If you don't like a champion, figure it out. I don't know. Grew up in Montgomery and had a great father and a great mother who had me in church all the time. I remember my dad, he was on the board and he was a deacon and he sat in the back of the, of the sanctuary and, and, and he was responsible for getting all the offering plates. And he would always sit me. I was his son. I sat there with dad. I was sat there with him. And I'd watch as he'd walk and he'd pass out the offering plates. And I would watch as people put in. And you know what else I watched? I watched when people didn't put in. And I remember I would ask my dad often, now what is it that we're doing? And he would tell me, we're taking up the tithes and the offerings. And you you hit on that. You didn't even know I was going to talk about this today. Pastor Keith didn't even, this this is a bonus right here. We're going into it. My dad said, that your tithe, he said 10% of every dollar is your tithe. He said, son, the Bible tells us it's a requirement. You give it. Everything belongs to him anyway. He requires 10 of it to come back into the church. That's what he told me. He said, your offering is everything above that 10%. He said, I want you to look at it like this. Your tithe is for your needs and your offering is for your wants. He said, when you tithe, he'll take care of every need you have. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. What I've learned in my life, that when I go above and beyond, and when my offering is greater than my tithe, watch out, because God is really going to do something with your life. Don't you ever let an offering plate pass you by without putting something in it. That was something I learned from my father. And I'm going to tell you, they didn't have online giving back in them days. You either put in it or you didn't. There's something to be said. I know we're in in an unusual time, but I can't wait to get back to when the offering plate comes by because there's something about holding up your tithe and your offering and putting it in. I think it's important for the younger generation to see that you're a giver. If you embrace generosity, what will the next generation do? They'll run with it. So you're going to go and you're going to die in this life. If you're known as a stingy person, now you'll be known as a stingy person when you're gone. That'll be your legacy. If you're a person that doesn't love the things of God, you'll be a person who didn't love the things of God. If you're an alcoholic, if you struggle with alcohol, when you leave this earth, that's what you'll be known for. Are you, are you hearing me today? If you love the things of God, you'll be known as a lover of the things of God. What do you want to be known for? I'm a product of my father. I give today because my father gave. Every week he gave me an offering. I remember as a young man going to a Winn-Dixie grocery store. Some of you may know what that is. A Winn-Dixie, the beef people. (laughs) Montgomery, Alabama. I was probably more than four four or five years old. And I remember my mom sent... My dad out to pick up a few things at Winn-Dixie and 
I always like going to the store with dad because, because he always bought extra things like little Debbie cakes. And when you're a little fat kid, that's what you like. Love me a snack cake. <laughs> little Debbie cakes and the biggest thing of toilet paper you could find. I don't know what it was with dad and, and the biggest thing, the biggest case of toilet paper he could find, but he'd, he'd had that thing on his shoulder walking through the grocery store with it. And I would say, Dad, why, why do you need that much? He said, as long as I got you in the house, we're going to need it. <laughs> dad was calling me a doo-doo head. I didn't even know it, you know. Walking through the Winn-Dixie and filled the cart up. Dad only needed us to get a few things, but, you know, he had the cart filled up. And I remember us going in line. And Montgomery, you know, Montgomery is the heart of, of the civil rights movement. I mean, I grew up in the town where, where Martin Luther King, he, he walked the streets and I passed his church often and I remember being in line and we had our cart full and I remember there was a young black lady in front of us and she had just a, a conveyor belt just full of groceries and formula and diapers and the things that she needed and I'm going to tell you, you could tell that she had a family that she had to take care of. Probably a young single mother. And I'll never forget as, as she went to go pay that the store would not take her payment. She tried everything. I'm sorry, we just, it's not working. She pulled out some food stamps and back then they were, they were she pulled them out. Sorry, these are no good. And I remember my eyes glued to her. And she looked down at her wallet, scrounging to try to find money to pay for it. Tears just began to stream down her face. I'll never forget this moment. And all of a sudden, my dad, I watched as he reached in and pulled his wallet out. And he stepped up. And he said, ma'am, sweetie, let me buy that for you. And he bought her groceries. And we left our cart there at the grocery store. Are you hearing me today? As a four-year-old, I'll never forget that moment. As we walked through the parking lot to the car, I could just see the back of my dad. And I remember thinking, man, dad is my hero. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but if I can do that right there, what I just saw. See, before I knew who Jesus was, my daddy was the first Jesus I ever saw with the way he lived his life. See, he just didn't take me to church. He lived church. He just didn't tell me about Jesus. He lived the way Jesus would have lived. In a town where, where racism was strong, let me tell you something, that has no place in the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about you, you, you I'm talking about you making it to heaven or hell today. I'm a product of my father and my mother. See, what you tolerate, they'll embrace. They're not saying, tell me the way. They're saying, show me the way. Our students, they've seen God, but they need somebody to, to show them the way. Man, I got a good, I got a good father. In a world where there's a lot of dads, there's very few fathers. In a world where there's a lot of moms, there's very few mothers. I remember growing up, my mom, she would, at night, she would pop popcorn and we'd watch Unsolved Mysteries and Rescue 911. That, 
and Unsolved Mysteries, that show scares me to this day. <laughs> and we'd sit up with her, and my dad, he would tell us he loved us, and he would slip all off to, to bed, and he would go in there and close the door, and it would be dark, but all of a sudden I'd see a, the light of the lamp that would come on underneath the door, and I remember there would be some nights I would go and I would crack the door open just to see what he was doing. And my dad wasn't the guy that was at church, just very, very open with his worship, very quiet, you know, at times. But I would have cracked that door and I would see him laying on the bed with his Bible open. And he'd be face down in it. And tears would, some nights would be flowing and I'd catch him. Just a glimpse of him Spending time with his first love. See, they might not see all that you do, but they might just catch a glimpse of how great he is at times through the way you live your life, and they'll never be the same. I've never forgot it. Some nights he would invite me in, and he'd read me stories out of that Bible, and I never forgot them. I'm a product of my father. I love God today and I stand here on this stage because my father loved him first. I remember on Sunday nights, we had Sunday night service and I'm going to tell you, the, 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 the sold out crowd came on on Sunday nights, the, the, the ones that were for real about it <laughs> showed up, the crazies in the church showed up on Sunday night. The ones that might not smell that good, but they were going to get after it in them altars, you know. Sold out crowd Sunday night. Be about, a, be about a third of the church, you know. And we'd have some of the greatest moves of the Holy Spirit I've ever seen on those Sunday nights. But I remember sitting there in the back on Sunday nights and they were in the altars one Sunday night. And I remember my dad, he was up there and he was praying for people in the altar. And I was in the back cutting up with some of the other kids in the church. And I was back there and we were goofing off. And then my dad, he's up there praying. But all of a sudden when he walked off, he just kind of looked up at me and gave me that look across the sanctuary. Like, yeah, you better sit down, you know. I thought, oh, Dad's looking. <laughs> and then he went back to pray, and I was like, oh, he ain't paying attention. And I went and started acting up again, you know. Next thing I know, Dad snatched me up. <laughs> Takes me out of the swinging doors out the back. <laughs> All I could see was the hallway leading to the Sunday school rooms and Dad's coattail swinging in front of my face some as he's dragging me. And I thought, oh, it's dark back here. <laughs> Dad's taking me to my Sunday school class. We don't have Sunday school on Sunday nights, you know. <laughs> he goes in there and closes the door. <laughs> he locks the door, and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> then he grabs me. He looks, and he goes, <laughs> boy, have you lost your mind? <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, but you have, you know. <laughs> Dad's done lost his mind. And, and next thing I know, it sounded like a machine gun. The belt came through the loops. <laughs> Dad wore me out. <laughs> That's why I don't have a butt today. He knocked it off. It's in the floor. I bet if you go to that building, it's probably still in the car, but it's vacuuming over the top of it. Wore me out. Oh, Dad has done lost his ever-loving mind. And then he unlocked the door. I thought, oh, thank God. He walks me to the bathroom. He gets the water running. And he bathed my face. He reached in his pocket and he pulls out a peppermint. That's what you do to a little fat kid after you whoop him. <laughs> Give him peppermint. Gives me a peppermint. <laughs> he said. Leans down, got on his knee, and he gave me a big old hug. And he said, boy, I, I want you to know something. I love you. More than anything. But you're not going to act up in church. Because that's not who you are. That's not who you are. You're not like the rest of them. 
Boy, I didn't act up in church no more. We went back in that sanctuary and I said, y'all better sit down. Dad's in, here, in the building. <laughs> I'm a product of my father. Sometimes tough love is the answer. You're shaping greatness with the way you live your life. I remember a Saturday morning, Dad came and he woke me up and it was still dark outside. <laughs> he said, hey, it's time to get up. I said, Dad, it's, it's still nighttime. <laughs> he said, get up and put your play clothes on, which meant we were going to get dirty. <laughs> I put them on and I said, all right. He said, come on, we're going to go to the church today. I said, all right. He said, we got to leave early because we got to go pick up. We got to go pick up Brother Young. It was a, an older pastor in our church whose car was broke down and was, was having work done on it, and he couldn't make it to the, to the men's work day, that, what we were going to. He couldn't make it there. So Dad, he leaves 30 minutes early, goes across town, picks him up. So he's doing for people that can't do for themselves, see. Picks him up, he runs through a Hardy's drive through and he buys his breakfast. See, that's what you do. When people are in need, you help them out. And we pull up to the church. The sun had finally came out and we pull into the back parking lot and I looked and I saw men on the church. It was so funny. It was so funny and so interesting that the same men that were at the church for work day were the same men that I could eye putting something in the plate on Sundays. And the same people that didn't put anything in the plate on Sundays were the ones that didn't show up for the work days. That's for free today. And so I see them out there and they're working on the church. Some of them are on the roof. Some of them are painting. Some of them are out there cleaning. They're doing the flower beds. Some of them are out there mowing. And they're doing all that and they're sprucing the church up. I don't know when the last time you showed up at your church and helped out, but you need to show up and help the church out sometimes. If they call a work day, you show up for it, men. Women, if they call a work day for the ladies, you show up for it. You're the church. And this building is for the unchurched. And I don't know about you, but the world, they're cleaning up their properties. Why not keep the church clean? That's for free today. And so I'm watching them. And they're working out there on the property. And then I can see out on the playground all the, all the sons of the men that were there working. They were out there on the playground. It was mass pandemonium on the playground. Chaos. Swings were swung all the way around. Somebody was up on the picnic pavilion. I don't know, you know how they got up there. Some of them were running around. Some of them were... Standing there looking around, just kicking a ball. <laughs> One of them was on a merry-go-round, just hanging off of it. <laughs> Throwing up everywhere. <laughs> just absolute chaos on the playground, I thought. I can't wait to get to the playground. <laughs> I'm going to get there and lose my mind. I'm going to get there and throw up on a merry-go-round. I, I, I want to throw up right now just thinking about it. <laughs> Picking my nose and throwing up. So I'm out there, I can't wait to get to the playground. I get, out of the, I get out of the truck and I start running towards the playground. And all of a sudden I hear a voice. It sounded like James Earl Jones. <laughs> Boy, where are you going? I said, oh my God. Turn around, dad's sitting there. I'm like. He said, Boy, where are you going? I'm going to the playground. He said, ah, oh, there's work to do. I was about six years old. I said, but dad, the rest of them's out on the playground. Well, that's the wrong thing to say. <laughs> dad comes over there and he grabs my shirt. I didn't know you could roll the front of my shirt up that much. <laughs> he had that thing rolled up and he had me face to face. I could smell his breath. <laughs> I could still smell, I could, I, could, I could feel the steam coming off of his breath. <laughs> Hit me across the face. Oh, <laughs> I smelled the hardies. <laughs> He said, I don't, i never forget this. He said, boy, there's work to do. He said, you are my son. 
I don't care if the rest of them are out there on the playground. You ain't the rest of them. You're my son, and there's work to do. Pivotal moment in my life. And so here we go. I go to work with the men. <laughs> Walk over to the pavilion, and that's where I got introduced to my first fidget spinner, a weed eater. It was a, a, a husk varna <laughs> weed eater laying on the ground. <laughs> you a fat, a fat ADD kid? <laughs> Give him a weed eater, for crying out loud. I was the biggest kid out there. I could handle it, right? <laughs> Dad picks it up. He cranks it. Woom, woom, gets it going. I thought, all right. <laughs> he turns it off, puts it down. I said, okay. He said, that's a weed eater. I said, yes, sir. He said, come here. You're going to take that weed eater. He said, you see all these high weeds where the mower didn't get? Yes, sir. You see all these weeds out here on this church property? Yeah. You're going to take that weed eater and you're going to knock those weeds down all over the property. And I said, Dad, how long is that going to take? He said, I don't know, son, until, it, until it's finished. I thought, great. <laughs> I said, okay, well, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to crank the weed eater. He said, boy, I just showed you how to crank it. I thought, oh, Lord, Dad's done lost his mind again, but I ain't going to say nothing about it. <laughs> 45 minutes later, I got it cranked. My arm fell off. Brother Young, the one we picked up, he's sitting over there, and I'm sitting there, and I get that thing, and I can't even hardly handle it, you know. And he's like, boy, I believe you was built for that. And I thought, I wish Dad hadn't picked him up. And I go, and I knock down all the weeds. And three hours later, my underwear had disintegrated. A rock knocked my eye out. I was bleeding all on my shins, my little chubby legs. I was, I had a wedgie. It was there. I mean, it was up in there. It was all the way to the to outer space. It was way up in there. and Sweating and teeth busted out. I could, I was, I could, I could hear the rocks crunching in my teeth. Finally got it done. Kids out there on the playground, they're making fun of me. <laughs> I thought, oh, my Lord. <laughs> so I finally get it done. I said, good job. I was like, great. That's what you get. You get a good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can't walk, but it's cool, you know. <laughs> then something else happened. And them ladies in the church, they bring out a tray of bagel bites. <laughs> and they take it out to the playground. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> they get bagel bites. You know I love a bag of bite. And I ain't going to get any. Because I ain't on the playground. I thought, man. And they're out there fixing them some bag of bites and Kool-Aid out there at the picnic table. And I'm standing there. All of a sudden the doors come open. The men, they went in. One of them comes out and they said, hey, you coming in with us. I got to go with the, into the air conditioning. And we didn't have bagel bites in there. We had all the really, really good food that all the women had cooked for the men. Because all of a sudden, I wasn't a kid on the playground anymore. I put the work in with the men. I got to eat with the men. I learned a valuable lesson that day that my, that my father taught me. So you can go out on the playground, you can dine with peasants, or you can put the work in and dine with kings. It's really up to you. I'm a product of my father. Today. He always led the way on church Sunday mornings. And here we are on a Sunday morning. We get up. He was either standing at the sink in his whitey tidy shaving or he was cleaning his shoes or dad was up leading the charge. He, Mom didn't have to wait for dad to drag out of the bed. He wasn't in the bed. He was up leading the way. He had that southern gospel blaring on the radio. The McCamies. Got on the mountain. And I would get dressed and I would watch the Bozo Super Sunday show. Watch him drop ping pong balls in a bucket and get a board game for it, you know. I thought, I'd love to do that, you know. On the way to church, we'd get there and 
Dad would ask if we brushed our teeth, and most Sunday mornings I did not. <laughs> and he would always have a roll of certs ready, and he would have the full just off the top, and he'd have where he could just flick it off to me, you know. He, Dad knew I wasn't hygienic during those days and had it ready. When we get to the parking lot, he'd give me a dollar. Put it in there. And I'd go back to a children's church, a rusty, fold-out metal chair, and I'd sit there, and a volunteer couple in our church, they, they showed up every week, and they taught the great stories of the Bible. They were a father and a mother in my life, too. And I heard about Daniel and the lions then, how he got to sleep all night with the kitties. <laughs> We heard about the three boys, how they went in the fire. And when they got in there, there was a fourth man that had come on the scene. And that they came out unharmed and untouched with not even the smell of smoke on their clothes. And we'd hear about it. I was like, oh man, that's awesome. And those stories were in rotation and every year we'd hear one of them. And I couldn't wait till it was time to hear about the story of Samson. Strongest man to ever live. Was killing big, ferocious animals with his bare hands. Killed a, killed a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone. With a, with a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand men. I thought not only was he the strongest man to ever live, he's the first hip-hop artist, you know. And some of the versions of the Bible, he don't use the word donkey. He uses the other word for donkey. <laughs> I like that version better. <laughs> Reaches out and grabs you more, you know what I'm saying? Some of you get in a little bit. You might need to read your Bible. <laughs> Ew. Don't get up and walk out on me. This guy was bad to the bone. When I thought about Samson, I thought about the ultimate warrior because I watched wrestling on Saturday mornings and the ultimate warrior was this crazy strong guy that face painted up and when this music hit, he'd run out of the tunnel just as fast as he could. And he'd get up in the ring and he'd shake the ropes. And on Saturday mornings, I'd run through the house when he ran out of the tunnel and when he shook the ropes, I'd shake the pillows in the living room. I thought, man, Samson is bad to the bone. Strongest man to ever live. Don't nobody want none of that smoke. You know what I'm saying? He could do it. And he had a little bumpy path, you know. You know, Delilah. She was probably pretty pretty, you know. And <laughs> he laid his head in the lap of Delilah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They, the secret was in his hair, and, and, and he gave up that. And they cut his hair, and they plucked his eyes. And but, but, but now I would sit on the edge of my seat, and I would say, but just wait. <laughs> Just wait, because he's going to get him back. Just wait. And he's sitting there, and he asks the Lord to give him his strength one more time. And he gets led to the pillars. And I was like, oh, he's fixing to get him. And the Lord gives him his strength back, and he pushes the pillars down. And I thought, man, he got him. Right? It turned out good, didn't it? Then I get, and I read the story. A few years ago, I went and I read the story. For over a year, year and a half, I just read the story of Samson. And I thought, oh, man, they didn't read us this in children's church. Samson made for greatness. But, man, did he fall short. Out sleeping with prostitutes. Out betting and making riddles with people. He had no business hanging with, partying. Not using his strength for God's glory, but for his own. And as I go, as I read that story, I thought, man, what more would I have read about if he'd have just done what he was supposed to do? The saddest part is, is he laid his head in the lap of Delilah. See, he just went around it too much. The more you do something, the more you'll give in. The saddest part of that story is, is not where he fell short, 
The saddest part is that it said that the Spirit of the Lord left him, and he didn't even know it. The Spirit of the Lord doesn't leave us. I feel like sometimes as a church, we've laid our head in the lap of Delilah. We've spent too much time out on the playground. You know when he realized that it had left him? When they took his eyes, when he lost his vision. You want to know when things are getting bad? When you lose your vision. And I read that story and I think, man, where did it all start? And we just read about Manoah. The woman was out in the field, but the, no, the man was nowhere to be found. I read that story and I thought, why was the woman out in the field and the man not? I want you to listen to me, man. Growing up, I saw women do a lot more in the church than I saw the men. And I'm not saying they can't. And I'm not saying you women shouldn't. I'm just saying they shouldn't have to all the time. See, we live in a world where there's a lot of dads but very few fathers. And we see Manoah, see the wife, she saw the man in the field and she went and she told her husband. And it was clear that Manoah knew there was a God because it said that Manoah prayed. I ain't just talking about you living bad. I'm talking about you showing up. He knew there was a God because it said that he prayed to him. Send the man you sent to my wife so that he can tell me. Do you think it was a coincidence? Or do you think it was, or do you think God made a mistake? Said he heard Manoah and he sent the angel back. And where did he send it? In the field where the man should have been. And the story says that the woman, she had to go look for Manoah. And when she she found him, she told him, and it said he got up and followed her. I want you to listen to me, man. You better not be letting the women do all the work and you sitting down. You got some Samsons on your hands. You got the future on your hands. And whatever you you tolerate, the next one will embrace. If he'd have just had a dad to be around a little bit more, I wonder if it was a pattern that Samson saw in his life. Maybe he saw his dad sitting down more than he saw him working. Maybe if he'd have just had a dad to say, Samson, why are you out here messing with these people? Why are you out here letting them braid your hair? Why are you out here betting all your money? Why are you out here letting the unclean things touch your lips? Alcohol was to never touch his lips. I'm talking to you today, church. Somebody said, are you going to die on that hill? I might. If alcohol wasn't good enough for the strongest man to ever live, it ain't good enough for you either. I'm not talking about you going to heaven or hell. I'm talking about you missing out on the great things that God has planned for your life. I've never met an alcoholic that didn't take a first sip. It never works out good. Every time alcohol is involved, people end up doing stuff they had no business doing. Having affairs. Having people killed. 
missing out on stuff. You better hear me today. Somebody said, well, he didn't say that to David. Have you read the story of David? Didn't work out so good for him either, did it? You better listen to me today. A margarita for you on vacation might be okay for you. But for your son or your daughter, because you tolerated it on vacation, they will embrace it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday when the work day wasn't good. You better hear me today. You got Samson's on your hands, and they're going to be a product of you. And what you do with your life when you're gone will be what they'll be left with. They'll either love the things of God or they won't. I know we've been in a pandemic. But when you can sit at a restaurant for two hours on Saturday night but can't come to church on Sunday morning because you're scared to get sick, it's hogwash. You either love them or you don't. You're either going to get up and live for them or you're not. I've seen too many students who don't have a dad around. I've seen too many students who don't have a mom around. I've read too much about the problems of this generation and the problem is they don't have a father and a mother to live the things of God in front of them. They're a product of you. You may not physically have a son or a daughter, but you're a father or a mother. They're watching you. Your every move, can somebody come play for me ever so softly? I wonder what it's going to look like for my little boy. I find it so interesting in the story of Samson. He was sitting there in chains and he didn't have the Lord. He had left him. Couldn't see. And he asked, God, if you would just give me my strength back one more time. When it come time to for him to get to those pillars, it was a young lad. young boy that led him there. A young lad who still had his eyes to see. Church, when we lose our way, it's going to be this younger generation that's going to lead us back. They're on your watch today. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes, don't look to me, just look to Jesus today. I know I've talked strongly to you today. I've talked to you as a father and a mother, but now I want to talk to you as a son and a daughter. That there's a father in heaven that's so crazy about you. He'll never leave you. And he's saying, you're my son, you're my daughter. And there's work to do today. 